if you zoom into anything, what are you going to see? Of course, you're just going to see physics. What else could be underneath, right? It's not going to be fairy dust. It's going to be physics and chemistry. But that doesn't take away from the magic of the fact that there are certain ways to arrange that physics and chemistry, and in particular, the bioelectricity, which, which I like a lot, uh, to give you an emergent uh, collective with goals and preferences and memories and anticipations that do not belong to any of the subunits. So I think what we're getting into here, and we can talk about um, how how this happens during embryogenesis and so on. What we're getting into is uh, the origin of the se- of of a self, yeah, with a big with a capital S. So we ourselves. There are many other kinds of selves, and we can tell some really interesting stories about where selves come from and how they become unified. Yeah, is this the first, or at least humans tend to think that this is the the level at which the self with a capital S is first born. But, uh, and we really don't want to see um, human civilization or Earth itself as one living organism. Yeah. That's very uncomfortable to us. It is, yeah. But is, um, yeah, where's the self born? We have to grow up past that. So what I like to do is, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you two quick stories about that. I, I like to roll backwards. So so as opposed to, so if you start and you say, okay, here's a paramecium and you see it, um, you know, it's a single cell organism, you see it doing various things and people will say, okay, I'm sure there's some chemical story to be told about how it's doing it. So that's not true cognition, right? And people will argue about that. I, I like to work it backwards. I say, let's 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 agree that you and I, are, as as we sit here, are examples of true cognition. If anything is, if there's anything that's true cognition, we are we are examples of it. Now let's just roll back slowly, right? So you roll back to the time when you were a small child and used to doing whatever, and then just sort of day by day, you roll you roll back, and eventually you become more or less that paramecium, and then and then you sort of even below that, right? As a, as a, as an unfertilized oocyte. So. It's the, no one has, to my knowledge, no one has come up with any convincing, discrete step at which my cognitive powers disappear. Right? It just doesn't. The biology doesn't offer any specific step. It's com- it's incredibly smooth and slow and continuous. Yeah. And so I think this idea that it just sort of magically shows up uh, at one point and then and then uh, you know humans have true selves that don't exist elsewhere. I think it runs against everything we know about evolution, everything we know about developmental biology. These are all slow continua. And the other really important story I want to tell is where embryos come from. So think about this for a second. Amniote embryos, so this is humans, uh, birds, and so on, uh, mammals and birds, and so on. Imagine a flat disk of cells. So there's maybe 50,000 cells. And in that, so so when you get an egg from a from a fertilized, let's let's say you buy a fertilized egg from a farm, right? Mm-hmm. That that egg uh, will will have about 50,000 cells in a, uh, in a flat disk. It looks like a little, little tiny little frisbee. And in that flat disk, what'll happen is uh, there'll be uh, one one set of cells will uh, becomes will become special, and it will tell all the other cells, "I'm I'm going to be the head. You guys don't be the head." And so it'll amplify symmetry breaking amplification. And you get one embryo. There's a there's a you know there's some neural tissue and some other stuff forms. Now now you say, okay, I had one egg and one embryo, and and there you go. What else could it be? Well, the reality is, and I used to I I, I did all of this as a, as a grad student. If you um. If you take a little needle and you make a scratch in that blastoderm in that in that disc, such that the cells can't talk to each other for a while, it heals up. But for a while, they can't talk to each other. What will happen is that uh, both regions will decide that they can be the embryo, and there will be two of them. And then when they heal up, they become conjoined twins. And you can make two, you can make three, you can make lots. So the question of how many selves are in there cannot be answered until it's actually played all the way through. It isn't necessarily that there's just one. There can be many. So what you have is you have this medium, this this undifferentiated, I'm sure there's a there's a psychological um, version of this somewhere that I don't know the proper terminology, but you have this you have this list like ocean of potentiality. You have these thousands of cells and some number of individuals are going to be formed out of that, usually one, sometimes zero, sometimes several. And they form out of these cells because a region of these cells organizes into a collective that will have goals, goals that individual cells don't have. For example, uh, make a limb, make an eye. How many eyes? Well, exactly two. So individual cells don't know what an eye is. They don't know how many eyes you're supposed to have, but the collective does. The collective has goals and memories and anticipations that the individual cells don't. And that that the establishment of that boundary with its own um, ability to maintain to to pursue certain goals, that's the origin of, of selfhood. But I, is that goal in there somewhere? Were they always destined? Like, are they discovering that goal? Like, where the hell did evolution um, discover this when you went from the prokaryotes to eukaryotic cells? 
and then they started making groups. And when you make a certain group, you make a you sh you make it sound and it's such a tricky thing to try to understand. You make it sound like this cells didn't get together and came came up with a goal, but the very act of them getting together revealed the goal that was always there. There was always that potential for that goal. So the first thing to say is that uh, there are way more questions here than than certainties. Okay, so yes, everything I'm telling you is is cutting edge, developing you know stuff. So so it's not as if any of us know the answer to this. But but here's 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 my opinion on this. I think what evolution. I, I don't think that evolution produces solutions to specific problems. In other words, specific environments. Like here's a frog that can live well in a froggy environment. I think what evolution produces is problem solving machines that that will that will solve problems in different spaces. So not just three dimensional space. This goes back to what we were talking about before. We the the brain is a evolutionarily a late development. It's a system that is able to to pursue goals in three dimensional space by giving commands to muscles. Where did that system come from? That system evolved from a much more ancient evolutionarily much more ancient system, where collections of cells gave. Uh, instructions to for cell behaviors, meaning cells move to 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 divide, to to die, to um, change into different cell types, to navigate morphous space, the space of anatomies, the space of all possible anatomies, and before that, cells were navigating transcriptional space, which is a space of all possible gene expressions, and before that, metabolic space. So what evolution has done, I think, is 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 produced hardware that is very good at navigating different spaces using a bag of tricks right which which i'm sure many of them we can steal for autonomous vehicles and robotics and various things and what happens is that um, they navigate these spaces without a whole lot of commitment to what the space is in fact they don't know what the space is right we are all brains in a vat so to speak every cell does not know Right, every, every cell is some other some other cell's external environment. Right, so where does the what, that border between you you and the outside world? You don't really know where that is. Right, every every collection of cell has to figure that out from scratch. And the fact that evolution requires all of these things to figure out what they are, what effectors they have, what sensors they have, where does it make sense to draw a boundary between me and the outside world? The fact that you have to build all that from scratch, this autopoiesis, is what defines uh, the border of a self. Now, biology uses like a um, a multi um, a multi scale competency architecture, meaning that every level has goals. So, so molecular networks have goals, cells have goals, tissues, organs, um, colonies, uh, and and it's the interplay of all of those that uh, that enable biology to solve problems in new ways. For example, in xenobots and, and various other things, um, this is. You know, uh, it's it's exactly as you said. In many ways, the cells are discovering new ways of being. But at the same time, evolution certainly shapes all this. So, so evolution is very good at this agential bioengineering, right? When when evolution is uh, discovering a new way of being an animal, you know, an animal or a plant or something, sometimes it's by changing the hardware, you know, protein, changing protein, protein structure and so on. But much of the time, it's not by changing the hardware, it's by changing the signals that the cells give to each other. It's doing what we as engineers do, which is try to convince the cells to do various things by using signals, experiences, stimuli. That's what biology does. It, it has to, because it's not dealing with a blank slate. Every time, as, as you know, if you're evolution and you're trying to uh, uh, make, make, a, make an organism, you're not dealing with a passive a material that is is fresh and you have to specify it already wants to do certain things so the easiest way to do that search to find whatever is going to be adaptive is to find the signals that are going to um, convince cells to do various things right your sense is that evolution operates both in the software and the hardware yeah. and it's just easier and more efficient to operate in the software Yes, and I should also say I, I don't think the distinction is sharp. In other words, yeah. I think it's a continuum, but I think we can. But I think it's a meaningful distinction where you can make changes to a particular protein, and now the enzymatic function is different, and it metabolizes differently, and whatever, and that will have implications for fitness. Or you can change the huge um, uh, amount of information in the gene, though that isn't structural at all. It's it's uh, it's signaling. It's when and how do cells say certain things to each other, and that can have massive changes as far as how it's going to solve problems.